Hi, my name is Mark Dunbar, and welcome to this lecture on 10 hacks for OCT interpretation in glaucoma. Just by way of disclosure, I do consultant work and advisory work for Carl Zeiss Meditech, Allergan, Genentech, Regeneron, and Nova Oculus. <clears throat> my goal today is really not to sell you an OCT or tell you which OCT I think is the best, uh, but rather really share with you some tips and pearls for interpreting the OCT in glaucoma. So I think we recognize that OCT has really changed how we manage ocular disease, particularly on the retina side for diabetes and macular degeneration, but also on the glaucoma side as well particularly spectral, spectral domain OCT, has really changed how we evaluate the optic nerve in glaucoma. It provides us objective data that we can, when we're looking at a nerve, compare it to a normative database. I think we've all seen a patient who we consider a glaucoma suspect, and I think there's no question our ability or sensitivity in sometimes discriminating a physiologic cup from a glaucomatous cup can be difficult. We know that big nerves can have big cups and of course automatically that puts a patient at risk of having glaucoma. But the reality is until you do a visual field and do other assessment like measuring intraocular pressure, sometimes having them come back on multiple visits, it's difficult to distinguish that patient who has physiologic cupping from glaucomatous cupping. So really what OCT has been able to do in many parts, but in this one in particular, is allow us to provide objective data, to compare your nerve to that of a glaucoma nerve or your nerve to a normative database to give you a hint or a clue, is this somebody who you really need to worry about? And so it really provides that other piece of the glaucoma puzzle, along with stuff that we've traditionally done in terms of measuring pressure, doing visual fields, and just the overall opinion or our clinical examination of the optic nerve. And then for those people who have glaucoma, I think it provides an objective means of monitoring progression. In particular, that's always been a challenge even among glaucoma specialists. When we were just looking at visual fields and trying to decide, is this patient worse? Is this glaucoma progressing? Uh, that has been a very difficult task to do because we know there's long and short-term fluctuations when you're doing a visual field. Sometimes patients have good days, sometimes they have bad days, and that can be a difficult task to do. So in addition to looking at a visual field, certainly an OCT provides that additional information in terms of, is this patient getting worse? And we'll go through a number of cases really showing that as we go along. So as I said, OCT really has changed how we look at retina, and it's changed how we manage glaucoma. In fact, here's a position statement that Arvo made in November 2016, essentially stating that everyone over the age of 60 is recommended to get an OCT scan at least once a year. Now, they didn't talk about how you pay for that, but I think just the recognition that that sensitivity of OCT in terms of just picking up occult maculopathy, looking at the AMD patient, the diabetic, the vitreo macular tractions, etc. But even, you know, identifying patients who may have glaucoma or are glaucoma suspects really can be a really very, very helpful. So I think it's a powerful statement and one that I think most of us has recognized in eye care, which is why so many people, certainly on the optometric side, has uh, purchased and utilized OCT on a daily basis. Now, when I'm doing a longer talk, one of the things I talk about is really why you should get one. And really, when we talk about that medical model, the fact that we're looking at an aging population and you look at things like diabetes and macular degeneration and other causes of vision loss, glaucoma is really, really up there. And we'll look at some of the numbers in just a few minutes, but I think we recognize that over the next 10 to 15 or 20 years, the number of glaucoma patients is going to increase significantly. I'm going to show you a stat in a little bit just talking about the fact that 10,000 people in the United States each day turn 65. And we know as you get older, that risk of conditions like glaucoma significantly increases. And so really some of the issues, recognizing that over half of the glaucoma patients in the United States have not been diagnosed. 
A number of population-based studies that have been done over the years have all shown that patients who walk in for eye screenings, there's a significant percentage that are yet to be diagnosed. In the Baltimore Eye Survey uh, in 1991, that number was about 56. In the Proyecto uh, Eye Study, that was about 62%. And we know that patients before they become symptomatic and suffer significant visual field loss. So again, from an optometric perspective, for those of us in the trenches, I think it's important to be able to utilize a technology that's going to help us increase our sensitivity in making a diagnosis of glaucoma. So getting back to the fact that you know we need help in terms of making the diagnosis and the fact that we've got an aging population. There's that statistic I already quoted that 10,000 people turn 65 in the United States every day through the next you know, 10 to 20 years. And you look at those patients who are considered the high-risk population, the African-American population, the Hispanic population, they're projected to increase from about 17 to 20% today to over 34% by 2050. And so that shouldn't be a big surprise to anybody. I think we see that growing trend, and we know that there's a high-risk population that are more at risk of developing glaucoma. So the traditional methods most of us are aware of, measuring the pressure, the subjective evaluation of the optic nerve, doing a visual field, you know, since the beginning of time almost, you know, those have been the three ways that we've kind of monitored glaucoma. And I think we recognize that all of them have flaws. We know that there's a range of normal pressure. You can have somebody with a pressure of 15 and have significant, severe, normal tension glaucoma, just as you can have somebody who's got a pressure of 25 and 30 and not have glaucoma. So we know it's a marker and gives us a red flag for somebody who you kind of consider as a glaucoma risk, and you get a baseline to determine what is their baseline pressure and how low does that pressure need to be. And just like looking at the optic nerve, we know that there's a wide variation in normal Uh, Big nerves, as we talked about, can have big cups. Um, And small cups doesn't necessarily preclude you from having glaucoma. We know the difficulties of visual field testing, that sometimes patients can have good days, they can have bad days. And in a glaucoma patient in particular, there can be, you know, there can be, there can be uh, a lot of fluctuations. Uh, The long and short-term fluctuations can be great, quite great, especially in somebody who has glaucoma and especially in areas that are preceding visual field loss. There can be you know, t- days where the visual field is good and there can be times where it's not so good before a patient develops definitive glaucoma. So you look at a technology like OCT that I think is really a great complement to the other methods that we look at in assessing somebody with glaucoma. And we'll go through that as we speak in the rest of the selector. This really just highlights the evolution of spectral domain OCT technology. Shouldn't say spectral so domain, but all there's a lot of different upper spectral left domain OCT and old technologies. Which one who, do you choose? Again, that T-slip Many people curve that are listening have already made a purchase the of the neural OCT retinal and rim and the they're used to the one you have. Let me just and tell you that I don't think there's a, a good bad entry point OCT technology into available. Kind of objective I think they're all very good. Some of them, you know, what make them uniquely different is the software. We'll go through and in glaucoma, image on your right is a Cirrus OCT, and that's really makes these many of us are utilizing. But whether you're looking at the Cirrus, the Eye View, the Avantis, that down at a few. Topcon Meister, but again, more sensitive all of them do more objective, an excellent job better repeatability in terms of diagnosing, on the bottom monitoring left, progression and doing things here. like that. This is the Heidelberg The reality is when you again, look at another these software software technologies, it really is about the software. On the retina side, it doesn't really matter as much because I think a B-scan is a B-scan. Whether you have an AMD or a diabetic or a vitromacular traction, all of them do a great job on a B-scan of identifying macular pathology and giving you a good anatomic perspective. In glaucoma, it is really about the software, and it's really whatever software you get used to. As I said, I think they're all good, they're all uniquely different, and the one you get used to is the one you're going to be kind of get to know intimately. So the bottom line, the device should be easy to use, it should be patient friendly, and obviously at the end of the day we're looking at price, uh, and so it's got to be affordable and fits into your package, into what you're able to afford. So as we kind of dig into this, I've broken this down. I call this 10 hacks or tips for OCT interpretation. And there's a laundry list of them, and I don't want to go through each one individually, but as we go through this lecture, we're going to address some of these things as we go along. So hack or tip number one, make sure it's a reliable scan. We're looking at a Cirrus OCT here. 
And so the first thing I think we all look at when we're looking at whether it's a Cirrus or an OptiView or any technology that we're used to using, you know, is it a reliable scan? Look at the signal strength. On the Cirrus in particular, I think a signal strength of at least 7 or over is important. Uh, a 6 I would consider borderline. Now, it doesn't mean you wouldn't rely on it if you didn't have good signal strengths, but I think you know you have to look at that scan in question. And maybe when you're kind of deciding does this patient have glaucoma or identifying patients over time, you know whether they're progression or not, I think it becomes more important to have a good reliable scan. On the OptiView, typically 40 and above from what I understand is really considered a good scan. On the Heidelberg Spectralis, you don't get a signal strength. And part of that is that the fact that you have a, sig uh, a scan kind of tells you that it's a good one. And you wouldn't get a good quality scan uh, with, a, with a Heidelberg Spectralis. It wouldn't really just show up. So, so uh, and I, my, my perspective is I'm used to using more of the Cirrus. Sometimes I use the OptiView, um, and I have less experience with the Heidelberg, although I do have a case that I'll talk to you about in a little bit. And so the other kind of tip that I would tell you is make sure there's no algorithm failure. You know, when you're looking at these scans, not only looking at signal strength as we've talked about, but you look at the scan in general. Is there, you know, is does the image of the optic nerve fit what your clinical impression is? You're looking at this patient who is not a high myope, but what they had in their macula was a little bit of a posterior staphyloma. And I'll show you the clinical pictures in a few minutes, but you can see that in the right optic nerve, the the, the, the RNFL thickness around the macula is a little bit thin. You can see the area on the deviation map that's highlighted is red. And so when you look at the quadrant scans and the clock hour scans, it looks like this patient could have thinning uh, inferiorly both in the quadrant and some of the clock hours. And so the question is, is this real thinning? Does this patient have glaucoma who might be a glaucoma suspect? Of course, you look at the left eye and you see a nice robust RNFL, normal thickness maps, no thinning. So you're looking at the right eye and trying to decide, does this patient have glaucoma? And the reality is that this is a patient that you cannot apply to the normative database because they've got a little bit of a posterior staphyloma, so the scan identifies it as being thin. And I'll show you in just a few minutes a patient, this patient, who when we do their ganglion cell analysis, it ends up being completely normal. So you have a situation where normal ganglion cell analysis and an abnormal optic nerve on the right side and so again, your question, does this patient have glaucoma? And the reality is you've got a scan that really doesn't fit your normative database and that there's algorithm failure and you really can't utilize, at least this patient, this scan. Here's another example of that. Here's a patient who, as you can see, when you look at the right optic nerve and the cup to disc ratio, it's much larger than the left. You know, when we measure that objectively, you can see that the nerve, the disc area, is larger on the right than the left. And so no question, you would look at this and wonder, does this patient have glaucoma? And when you do the scan, uh, the, the, the eye that's got the larger cup, it looks like in the inferior quadrant, there's thinning. And when you look at that inferior clock hour, it looks like there's thinning. So by all accounts, you would look at this and say, well, boy, this patient looks like they have glaucoma. They've got thinning of the RNFL. When you look at the thickness map, you can see that there's thinning. And when we measure it, it looks like there's thinning. Now, the reality is once again, that this patient has algorithm failure. So the scan just missed it, as you can see, and I don't know if it shows up, but that little area black, it really missed it. And so my next pearl is going to be to tell you whenever you do an RNFL scan, make sure you do three scans. And we always do three in our RNFL scans. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, you want to know how reliable these scans are. So look what happens. This was the third scan that we did of three. When you look at the first scan and the second scan, both of them are very similar, almost identical, but you both of those scans are normal. And so when we compare it to the scan that was abnormal on your left, the one that had algorithm failure, actually the one on your right, scan number three, that had algorithm failure and compare it to the, to the left scan, scan number one, you can see that there's a difference. And by the way, the ganglion cell complex in this patient was normal as well. So here's a patient, we did three scans, the third scan, for whatever reason, the machine just didn't do a good job of identifying the feature of the optic nerve, and it shows up as possible thinning. So my point was of hack number two, do three scans at a time. You want to really make sure that these scans are reliable. Because the question that I'm going to ask you, really the million dollar question is, if you're using OCT not only to make a diagnosis of glaucoma, but also to identify progression, the question would be, how much change 
do you need to have from visit to visit for it to be significant? And I'll give you that answer in just a second, but that's really the million dollar question, right? And so the other reason why you want to do three scans is that you can use two of those three scans as part of your baseline. So when the patient comes back, whether it's six months and a year, and you repeat the OCT RNFL, you can use two of those scans as your baseline. So the third scan or the next visit scan, you can try to determine how much change is occurring and really determining does this patient get worse. So the question I ask is how much change needs to occur on an...